we need to jump into dynamic alignment. The next question is asking about alignment. So I figured we'll just jump right into dynamic alignment and you know, take it away. What were some thoughts you were having about explaining what is dynamic alignment first and then maybe discussing how we apply it? Well, I mean, there's different ways you could start this conversation. One is to say, um, you know, good posture is just a moment during movement. So not even to think of a position, but it's just a moment during movement. So even if you're not moving, uh, you know, you're still always moving. There is postural sway. There's the, you know, breathing uh, mechanisms. There's the heart, there's circulation. There's so many movements going on. So instead of identifying positionally, identify with all the movements that are still going on. So a posture is just the best place to be to do the next movement, <laughs> right? So a posture is just a, the best place to be to do the next movement you want to do would be another definition. Um, but, you know, traditionally it would be, you know, years over the chromions and, you know, trochanters and all like that. Um, and that's fine. That's probably a visual, internal and external way. We have a little posture class in the Franklin Method where we practice that and embody that, you know, using the cardinal planes. And then you have, you know, an imaginary central axis. So a central axis to be able to visualize that, which is the crossing line between, you know, the median sagittal and medial coronal plane. That's a very good image to start your dance around good posture. Of course, it doesn't exist. It's a mental construct. There is no central axis in your body, but it would be a good way to have a start, you know, being more dynamic around that. And this central axis is not a pole or something rigid, but it's something mobile flowing. It's sort of something oscillating. So basically your spine is an oscillator. It's always moving just a little bit. So to pass around the workload between uh, the nerve, the motor nerves, and to you know make sure the pressures on the discs and the joints is always shifting a little bit. So you don't get too much in any one area and no muscle fiber is being overworked. So in dynamic alignment, the workload is, even though you're not moving really, there is movement and you're constantly shifting the workload and you have an oscillating more idea of your posture, which really is, you know, what postural sway is about. And so, you know, you have this idea of the center of gravity over a base of support and in how that moves around the center of gravity over the base of support to the plumb line is a huge thing also in research. Because for example, you know that people with back pain, um, they actually have more static posture. So they have less postural sway. So I'm always thinking, so why, are we teaching people to be in positions when being more in a position and keeping it is actually where people with back pain go? You know, so it's kind of, and and it's what and, reproduces the secondary pain associated with a back injury. You know, it's the static holds of those muscles around the spine and the trunk that we know now are the very cause of a lot of the pain, the quadratus and the rectus spinae, and you know all of those muscles around the spine, the big muscles, the global muscles that are substituting to try to splint. And exactly. unfortunately, there's literature out there that, you know, from some very powerful producers of research that are using the model of splinting as being stability or core control, which is disastrous um, in my mind. I think that it's, you know, I love the idea of the oscillation and the image that I've used sometimes is, you know, if you had 24 blocks that were stacked on or a slinky and it's in your hand because it's a really interesting structure, the human body, the verticality of it, the bipedal, but we're basically balancing this head and shoulders through a stack of 24 segments that there's always this kind of movement happening in a healthy person to be able to maintain that, like you, the oscillation. So I like the oscillation image a lot. Um, there, there's a question on the table now okay. that deals with a horizontal organization in the water as it pertains to alignment. And Irena said, a uh, slight detour, in swimming, alignment is very important, and we all use our own version of alignment, a happy place, as you both discussed. Do you believe Pilates can branch out to being done in a water? And I, I, I would answer that and just say, why not? 
Um, yes, why not? Absolutely, why not? Movement is movement. You you can exactly, and we are you know sixty percent or whatever fluid, uh, you know, and and so to actually embody that uh, can be very helpful, and it's to do that in the water is absolutely great. So one of the big ways I, I think you can improve alignment, dynamic alignment, is by improving embodying function in literally any area of the body. So, you know, it's not like, oh, we need to first work on the pelvis. No, no, no. The key place is the atlanto occipital joint. No, it's the feet first. You know, you could start anywhere and improve organization uh, and embodiment and it'll, it'll improve posture. So it doesn't even matter, you know, it's like, okay, where do we start from? Yeah. Or, you know, if you, you look at someone and in the dialogue and, and through what they are wanting, you can start in there, in that area of the body. But of course there are some classic things that a lot of people express, you know, through bad posture, which is, you know, rounded shoulders, forward head, uh, you know, overpronated feet or imbalanced pronation. There's many things like that, classic things. But basically, if you improve movement, you're going to get better posture. Mm. So I love to teach posture through movement, not through putting people in a position. I, I told you I have that process, which I think is quite nice. But then mostly I like to, if you improve movement, if you give someone uh, a way to, you know, discover um a better postural experience through movement, I think that is a very elegant way because then they'll feel the movement in the position. Mm. And the other thing is, is like, you know, not teaching postural cues that much, like, you know, lengthen your spine, drop your shoulders, you know, lift your pelvis, what, whatever, on and on, like a, you know, like that, but do something, you know, and we do a lot of that in the frank way, do things. And then suddenly afterwards, when it's over, we say, Anyone notice the spine feels more lengthened? Anyone notice the shoulders feel more dropped? Anyone notice the back feels freer? There we have it. That's what better posture feels like. So mm -hmm. stop teaching and give the people the experience of what you're talking about. So don't, don't, don't teach the good posture, but do something. And there's many things you can do. And then afterwards, oh, anyone notice that posture feels more comfortable and shoulders more dropped and the, you know breathing is more free? But one of the things we notice too is that just as simple as distribution of movement equals distribution of force. So exactly. when we looked at, I remember years ago in 1995, we looked at segmental movement of the spine of healthy people. And what we found is the majority of them moved from L5, S1 and L4, L5. And they didn't have any movement in the other segments from T2 down to L3 or L4. And then just putting them on, we did five exercises of doing roll downs and bridging and mermaid and some side bending. Five mm -hmm. exercises brought them back and they had a significant increase in segmental movement in their spine. But wow. the beauty was L4, L5, L5, S1 reduced by 50%. So if you're thinking of somebody, you know, again, this idea of um, being sedentary, Right. Mm -hmm. So sedentary, we're going to have, like you said, the rounded shoulders, forward head, shortened hip flexors, maybe decreased internal rotation, decreased ankle dorsiflexion, all these other areas that are just from habit. I mean, you can go out and if you're moving, it's going to change those things. You have movement. Then you're going to notice that you're walking, you're running, you're dancing, you're sleeping are going to be significantly better. And you know, these are really important points that if you're listening in the audience today or the recording of it, this is something that we have been just hammering of the idea of just keep creating positive movement experiences and let their bodies learn. Their bodies will learn and they'll have good experience. They'll keep coming back. Um, that dissected day of teaching Pilates, that's, that's been gone for decades now. So sitting down and, you know, trying to nitpick something or the, we call it the cueing vomit, Eric, where <laughs> you're, just, you're just throwing up everything you can in some perfect static posture while they're trying to push their feet into the reformer. Um, it's, it's long gone, long gone. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah. But, you know, one thing we, we you know, can't throw out is that, uh, you know, humans, especially, we're, we're actually really good, you know, cardiovascularly, and we have actually... 
uh, compared to you know other animals who have very good Domestic. breathing apparatus. So I think that um, if we if we can breathe well, if our breathing feels comfortable, um, I think that is an expression of good posture too. So mm -hmm. we we can't just look at skeletal or you know myofascial stuff. I think we should also look at organic stuff. Yeah. So does our posture allow for our lungs to expand properly? You know, it doesn't Digestion. give enough space to the heart, you know, like mm -hmm. things like that. Digestion, um, blood flow. Digestion, blood flow. flow. I mean, what does bad, bad posture do to digestion and the function mm -hmm. of all these organs, the kidneys? I mean, for example, um, you know, good posture, the kidneys need to be very positional organs. They have a certain space they have to live in. Otherwise, they're in trouble. And that's actually also part of posture, yeah. but hardly ever talked about, you know, let's align our kidneys. I was like, what? You know, <laughs> um, so or, I think we or move, as you said, move the kidneys. Yeah. Yeah, move the kidneys, move exactly. And kidneys, it's yeah. like every time you breathe, the kidneys moved, you know, in, the kidneys move da down, and when you exhale, you move up again. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And, you know, efficiency, you know, obviously it's just like energy in, energy out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of the world of training is, is about inefficiency, burning calories. So that's a very interesting thing also in the whole discussion is that, you know, in a way to be fit, right, um, exercise is stressing the body in a good way. Yeah. And I think part of the discussion is also what is a good way of you know, putting some load on the cardiovascular and myofascial system. What is a, the healthy way of doing that? And, and the, all of the anti-aging literature too is showing that, you know, we have to have some of these stresses on our body to be able to have the right, um, you know, health of the cell, the right health of the system. Exactly. And that, you know, things like sometimes intermittent fasting or, um, temperature changes. We're seeing a lot of literature come out on exposing right. ourselves to more than the eight degrees that we live in with our air conditioning, heating homes and cars. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, learning to have some of that and that, that actually increases the genetic lifespan uh, of, our, of, of our bodies and things 